conflicting rights and beliefs. Everyone's nightmare, everyone's nightmare is where one employee holds beliefs or expresses views which are at odds with the beliefs or protected characteristics of other staff. Now, last decade, we saw this with gay marriage. Last decade, we saw this with gay marriage. This decade, it's gender issues. And it shot up employers' lists of priorities because tribunals are increasingly finding that employees' beliefs amount to protected characteristics. Things that courts have decided amount to protected characteristics include things like um, climate change, a belief in mankind's uh, obligation to mitigate climate change more accurately, things like ethical veganism, things like Scottish independence, to which you could reply, I'm with Greta, yes, but what about aromatic crispy duck pancakes? And I'm not getting involved. But unfortunately, those aren't always the right answers. The problem for employers is that by not discriminating against one person on grounds of their protected characteristic, you're at risk of discriminating against another person on the grounds of their protected characteristic. To describe it as a minefield is like calling a Taylor Swift concert well attended. Daniel's law number seven. Dealing with conflicting beliefs, dealing with conflicting beliefs, page 63, is not the employer's fault. But you still need to deal with it. Dealing with conflicting beliefs is not the employer's fault, but you still need to deal with it. And there's one hot topic that everyone is talking about, the trans or the gender identity debate. On the one side, we have those who believe that biological sex is real, immutable, binary, and important, particularly in situations such as women's prisons or female toilets or sport. On the other side, there are those who support gender identity theory, which means you believe the gender you are or the gender you believe you are is more important than biological sex. People can choose whether they're male, female, something in between. Sex and gender are in effect the same and people are the sex and gender that they say they are regardless of biological and genetic makeup. Now, I do apologize for using the stark imagery of books and corners, but it really does often feel as though the two sides are constantly spoiling for a fight. Now, without getting into a debate about who's right and who's wrong, can I just check in the chat? Are there any questions about the definition of gender critical versus trans ally? Do I need to explain the difference in any more detail? Hopefully not. How many of you would like to start discussing uh, ethical veganism and Scottish independence right now? Well, no one said yes, so I'll take that as a no. Right. We know that gender critical beliefs, we know that gender critical, start that again. We know gender critical beliefs are protected under the Equality Act. Maya Forstatter taught us that. And it seems obvious, although there's no test case on it yet, that gender identity beliefs will be similarly protected. There is absolutely no way that any tribunal is going to say that trans ally beliefs, gender identity beliefs, are not covered under the Equality Act. So think about this scenario. Think about this scenario, which isn't uncommon nowadays. A gender critical feminist who you employ, a gender critical feminist who you employ, refuses to use female pronouns for a trans colleague. The trans colleague identifies as a, as a woman, but doesn't have a gender recognition certificate. The gender critical feminist refuses to use the acquired pronouns, the female pronoun. The gender critical feminist says, that person isn't a woman, he is biologically male, and I refuse to be told that I have to use the wrong pronouns for him. The trans employee submits a grievance, says they're being misgendered, says they're being harassed. The gender critical feminist says to the employer, don't you even think 
about putting me through a disciplinary. My belief that that person is a man, not a woman, is protected by law. Ask Maya. Now, do you say, do you say to the trans employee, sorry, we can't do anything, they're allowed to misgender you, in which case you run the risk of a harassment claim from the trans employee since you're vicariously liable for any harassment caused by misgendering? Or do you discipline the gender critical feminist employee for harassing the trans employee? In which case you run the risk of a direct discrimination claim from the gender critical feminist on the grounds that you're disciplining her because of her protected gender critical beliefs. In other words, can both employers, can both employees sue the employer and win? I wish I had a silver bullet and could tell you the answer. I haven't. The law is clear that people are entitled not just to hold a belief, but also to manifest that belief. The law says they shouldn't have to keep quiet about it. But sometimes manifesting belief can overstep the mark and become a problem. And the EAT's recently looked at this in a case called Higgs against Farmers School. It's an EAT case earlier this year. Let me tell you what it was about. Mrs Higgs was a Christian school counsellor who posted her opinions on Facebook about primary school education. She posted things like, when I say Christian school counsellor, she was a school counsellor who was Christian. I don't mean she taught at a Christian school. She posted things like, they are brainwashing our children and they're recruiting our children for the transgender roster. Now, a trans employee at her school complained and she was dismissed on the basis that her comments were transphobic. She claimed direct religion and belief discrimination, relying on her belief that someone cannot change their biological sex and relying on her belief in marriage as an institution between a man and a woman. And she won. The EAT said that employees with protected beliefs are entitled to manifest those beliefs and that an employer can only take action if the manifestation is objectionable and if the dismissal is proportionate. So we now have a strange mashup in these types of cases. I will explain this more in a second if you're already a bit confused. We now have a strange mashup in these types of cases between direct discrimination, which historically, other than for age discrimination, you've never been able to justify. You can't justify direct race discrimination. I didn't employ that black person. I didn't promote that black person because my client doesn't want me to promote them. Uh, you can never justify direct sex discrimination or pregnancy discrimination. I sacked that woman because she's pregnant. We had a really good reason, so it's okay. You can't justify it as a matter of law. But we now have a strange mashup of the law for direct discrimination that suggests that interference with manifestation of belief, an employer saying you cannot speak your mind on these issues, is allowable if it can be justified. And this is important for employers. So it now looks like, contrary to what everyone's thought for the last 20 years, you can justify direct religion or belief discrimination, but only up to a point. And the EAT gave some guidance on the factors that can be used by an employer when deciding whether the manifestation of the belief is so objectionable so as to justify disciplinary action. They're in the workbook, page 65. They're pretty vague. In fact, why, why don't you read them? They're at page 65 and I'll just put them up on the screen as well while we're going. So, I said it was vague. What should you do if you're faced with this situation? By the way, out of interest, in the chat box, who's come up with this or a similar situation? Clash of protected beliefs. 
not yet, says Jenny. Yes, says Laura. Yes, says Alison. Kirsten, not yet. Russ, no. Irina, not yet. Let's change the question slightly. Who's worried about this situation? Yeah. Oh, we're getting some fast responses there. Lots and lots of responses there. Everyone very worried about it. Right. So there's no perfect solution, but I can give you three suggestions. Together, together, these three suggestions probably make a least bad answer to a problem which simply doesn't have a good answer. Number one, have a clear policy in place. And we're on page 66, by the way. Have a clear policy in place for communications, especially social media. If you can point to a sensible policy that's been breached by the employee's actions, then any disciplinary action against that employee is easier to justify. Number one, have a clear policy in place. Number two, don't prioritise one belief above another. Where the beliefs of an employee clash with those of a colleague, never, ever, 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 ever base your decision on whose belief you agree with. If you believe in gender identity theory, don't sack the gender critical feminist and keep the trans ally as your go-to response. Unless you're genuinely a minor deity, this is above your pay grade. Even the courts don't do this. If you've got policies which set out your expectations about behaviour in the workplace, you'll have a clear document you can point people to in the event of conflict. And number three, if you decide you need to discipline or dismiss an employee in this situation, before you do so, go through the factors in Higgs. Page 65. Go through the factors in Higgs. Go through those nine factors. Expressly think about each one when taking your decision about whether to discipline. Keep a contemporaneous note. Better still, send yourself or send a colleague an email with your thoughts on each of those nine factors so you have a clear timestamp and no one can accuse you of making it up for the purpose of a later tribunal case. Here's the key point. If you can show a tribunal you've thought about these factors, you're much more likely to find the tribunal agrees that you've acted proportionately. If you can show a tribunal you've thought about these factors, you're much more likely to find the tribunal agrees you've acted proportionately than if you can't show a tribunal you've thought about these nine factors. Could training, mediation, warnings, other sanctions work instead? If not, make sure in your note you set out that you've considered lesser sanctions and you don't think they're workable because X, Y, Z. Now, I can't promise a tribunal will agree with you. Does this make sense, by the way, guys? Do you need more on this or have I explained it enough? Just in the chat. Um, I can't promise a tribunal will agree with you, but it's a lot more likely to uphold. Thank you. Thank you, people. Uh, a lot more likely to uphold the decision of an employer which has been through this process than one which hasn't. So this is all a bit of a tightrope. Employers are just going to have to continue wobbling along it, clutching at any advice we get from the courts along the way. And even with the wisdom of Solomon, the perfect method for balancing conflicting rights is as elusive as agreeing on the correct pronunciation of harassment. 